It shouldn't be surprising that a lot of the liberal sector of media and Washington politics are truly emotionally in a tailspin as a result of Donald Trump's victory. Not a narrow victory, but a solid victory. And I think what has been most traumatizing for them is that although they believe at the core of their being that they are the representatives of and the spokespeople for and the sole protectors of, the people in the United States who are the marginalized groups that they believe that they own and can exclusively protect, huge numbers of non-white voters migrated away from the Democratic Party from what would have been the first black woman president in American history and instead voted for the candidate that these media figures have spent eight years loudly insisting as much as they could that Donald Trump is a Hitler figure, a white supremacist, a fascist, somebody who puts, who intends to put minority, uh, minorities in camps. And so they realized their own impotence. They realized they don't have influence on anything. They realized no, really, as the poll showed, nobody trusts them. Nobody listens to them any longer. And a lot of them are really spinning out of control in a way that we haven't quite seen before. They're often spinning out of control. But this is sort of a separate level of derangement. Now, there has been a long time theme among a lot of liberal media television personalities and writers that Donald Trump is such a singularly, uniquely evil political figure that even if you have family members and friends who in the past have voted for Republican candidates, good noble patriots like George Bush and Dick Cheney or Mitt Romney or John McCain, this is an entirely new level of evil, people who vote for Donald Trump, so this theory goes. And as a result, they argue with increasing levels of stridency and explicitness that if you are somebody who has family members who have voted for Donald Trump, you ought to strongly considering severing ties with your own family as a result of those political differences. If you have friends, new friends, work friends, longtime friends from your adolescence or even your childhood, who you discovered voted for Donald Trump as well, you ought to, according to them, seriously consider severing those relationships as well because the act of rejecting the Democratic Party candidate, this secular Saint Kamala Harris in favor of a new Hitler, reveals such a irre irre irrevocably rotted aspect of their character that it's basically self-destructive and toxic to your mental health if you continue to have any relationships with them at all, even if they're your parents or they're, they're, they're your siblings or they're your children or your grandparents or your neighbors or your best friends for all of your life. We showed you a couple of weeks ago the MSNBC host Joy Reid, who actually had on her show a clinical research psychologist from Columbia, who she invited on explicitly to lay out this theory about why not only you're, you're justified, but you're probably advised to sever ties with people, especially for the holidays, who you have discovered voted for Donald Trump in this election. Earlier this week, the very same Joy Reid, not, I guess, satisfied with what she did on her own show, and I don't want to single her out, she's by no means alone in this, in this view, as we're about to show you, but she went on to, I think it was TikTok, and she didn't have her, the setting of her show. She didn't have a teleprompter. She had no script. She had none of the good camera angles that at least give you a little distance from having to look right at her. She put her face in front of the camera, and when discussing whether or not you ought to this Thanksgiving, cut off relations with your family or talking to people who have said they intend to do that with their family or their friends, Here's what she said about why that is so understandable. People are rightfully alarmed. They have a reason to be alarmed. And if, if, if you would vote for that, people may not feel so confident that they're safe with you. This is not crazy. This is legitimate feelings of fear of you and a feeling that you might not be someone they could trust if this thing goes way south. Autocracies go south real fast and things get ugly and people get asked to do things and turn people in and point people out and, and turn on them. 
And if, if you're voting affirmatively, gleefully for this, and people might, I don't know, may not feel so confident in you anymore. That's real, and you kind of have to live with it. So if you think that you can vote for what people see as their destruction and then demand that they still are cool with you and kiki with you and have Thanksgiving with you, like, I think you're kind of missing the point <laughs> of what people are upset about. They're afraid. And autocracy and fascism are things that are legitimate to be afraid of. So you may want to step back. You know, one of the things that genuinely amazes me, and I'm not just saying that for rhetorical effect, it does genuinely amaze me about people like this who live their lives in cable news studios, who work for a gigantic corporation where if she's not making a little bit more than seven figures, she's making very close to it, certainly is in the very top 1% of income earners in the United States. She spends her time dealing with obviously not the working class or anything like that, but with fellow elites at MSNBC, the people she has on her show, the members of Congress with whom she often uh, congregates, the advocacy groups that are very well funded that purport like she does to speak for people who decided they weren't going to vote the way she told them to. There's just no sense of humility. And I just, I, I cannot understand how someone like this could look at somebody who votes for Donald Trump, even knowing all the hatred she has for Donald Trump, all the beliefs she holds about why he's so menacing or toxic or white, uh, bigoted or whatever, and not even consider for one second that perhaps a lot of the people who voted for him voted for him either because they don't believe that about him or because they might believe it about him, but nonetheless voted for him despite that because they think it's true of the Democratic Party as well, but they principally voted for it because unlike Joy Reid and the people she knows, they're actually confronting a lot of economic difficulty. And the last thing they want to do, as has been true in American politics for decades, is vote for the candidate and for the party that is already the one in power that has made their lives, their material lives and their view so deprived. There's just no space in a brain this dogmatic and simple-minded to have empathy for anybody who even has a slightly different view than she does because she goes on every, every night and says Trump is a Nazi, he's a fascist, he's a Russian spy, he wants to put me and other uh, people who are dissidents and minorities into a concentration camp. She believes that everybody else believes that, notwithstanding how tiny of a percentage of people know who she is or watch her show because the world in which she, which she occupies is one in which everybody else believes that. So for her, anybody who voted for Donald Trump didn't do so out of economic struggle or deprivation or agreement with him on certain social issues or desire to end. No, it's because, as she said, they voted for autocracy and tyranny and the destruction of people like Joy Reid, people are, the government's coming after Joy Reid. She's very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable person. And therefore, how can you have any kind of social communion with such people, given that they've proven by virtue of their vote, not for Kamala Harris, but for Donald Trump, that these are evil people. And there's a constant implicit encouragement. You know, you're born into this world. You have basically one family. You may form other very close relationships that you consider your family, but one biological family or one adoptive family, one immediate family, your, your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, your children. This is what forms the foundation of, of human civilization, of our, of our instinctive devotion and loyalty. And to encourage people to terminate those, to no longer talk to, people in your own family, not because they've done anything directly to you that's abusive or that betrays your trust, but because they cast a vote for a candidate that you don't support or to do so with your very close friends, which studies show most Americans don't have a lot of. It's really mentally deranged. It's actually, I think, quite evil to encourage. It, it really is if, you, if, you, if someone joins a cult, one of the very first things that they're told 
is that it's unhealthy for them to maintain relationships with anybody who doesn't understand the cult, with people who don't support the cult, who aren't part of the cult's core belief system. That's how they isolate people, cut off their key relationships with outsiders and make sure that the person becomes increasingly dependent on the teachings and the decrees and ideology of the cult and loyalty to the cult, to the cult leaders. That's what these people are trying to foster. Now, as I said, this has been a theme that has developed over time. Here's the New York Times in November 15, 2016, right after Trump won the first time. The headline was, Political Divide Splits Relationships and Thanksgiving Too. And they were narrating how a lot of people have a great deal of difficulty seeing their family members if they know they voted for Donald Trump, that even in their own personal relationships or even spousal relationships, it is starting to fracture the trust that people have in one another. This is really, really deranged stuff. Here is the Washington Post right around the same time, November 18, 2016, entitled Surviving Thanksgiving, Your Family Voted Wrong. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, it's fight, flight, or drink. Surviving Thanksgiving when you hate how your family voted. What? Where does this come from? I mean, people inside families have been voting for different candidates for generations. That's kind of the nature of American politics. Young people often see the world one way. Their parents see the world another. Their grandparents see it an entirely different way. People see the world differently based on their economic status, their social status, their social values, their religious convictions, where they live, what their community believes. And I, other than the Civil War, where there's actual violent war, deadly war that often involved family members on different sides, the United States has never been a country where people were encouraged to fracture their family ties or their marital relationships or their longtime friends based upon political differences. This is something that the media began encouraging in the wake of Donald Trump. Here was Harper's, the magazine Harper's, in November of 2017, entitled, quote, if you are married to a Trump supporter, divorce them. I, let me say that again. I know it's kind of shocking to believe. The headline is, if you are married to a Trump supporter, divorce them. The unfortunate truth about being in a relationship with someone who supports Donald Trump. And you may recall as well that, and we went over this several times, that a couple of the themes of the Kamala Harris campaign, including advertisements that they broadcast in all the swing states, was based on this theme that a lot of marital strife, a lot of intra-family conflict is due to the fact that a lot of women don't want to vote for Trump the way their husbands do, but want to secretly vote for Kamala Harris. But the Democrats' view of marriage is that women are mindless, obedient vessels who do what their husbands tell them to do, and they're afraid to have open communications with their husbands. And so these ads were encouraging these women to lie to their husbands about who they intended to vote for, go into the voting booth, vote for Kamala Harris instead of voting for Donald Trump, and then come out and mislead their husbands into believing that they actually voted for Donald Trump. It's such a dehumanizing and, and decadent view of marriage and families. Here is GQ, November 2017, just like the prior article, right on the verge of Thanksgiving in 2017. Quote, it's your civic duty to ruin Thanksgiving by bringing up Trump. This turkey day, consider, your, uh, uh, making, consider making life hell for a few of your relatives. Also essentially encouraging people that you should go to Thanksgiving, you shouldn't ask about how your grandparents are doing, catching up with your siblings, meeting their new partners, getting to know their kids as they're growing. No, you should go there with the specific intention of upsetting people by deliberately bringing Donald Trump up to people that you know support them and trying to attack them for having done so. Politico, right around the same time, November 2017, this is the first Thanksgiving after Trump won, Trump ruined Thanksgiving. How Donald Trump ruined Thanksgiving, a new study finds that after last year's scorched earth presidential campaign, Americans could barely stand to look at each other in the eye. 
Americans could barely stand to look each other in the eye as a result of the election outcome, according to Politico. Mother Jones, also in November 2017, you see this is all around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving fact-checking. Some Thanksgiving Trump defense fact-checking. It was purporting to provide its readers with things that they could and should say when they went home for Thanksgiving and learned that some of their relatives had voted for Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton, and they were supposed to raise political arguments and mount the defense, and Mother Jones was purporting to arm them with the fact-checking so that you can tell your uncle or your grandparents or your mother who voted for Donald Trump that they were deceived and misinformed and ignorant and stupid. And according to Mother Jones, here are all the reasons why you were supposed to tell them that. I'm not saying I haven't seen political discussions during Thanksgiving holidays that I've had with my family over my entire life. I, I presume lots of people have political discussions or even disagreements in passing. But the idea of family is the reason you're spending Thanksgiving with them. It's a holiday set aside for you to go do that. It's precisely because it's a time that you're supposed to nurture those family bonds. We have a very modern society. It's not the case anymore in the United States. And it's interesting in Brazil, there's still a culture like this. There still is in a lot of other countries, but not the United States, where families stay together, oftentimes Kids leave the house at 18 to go far away to college and they don't really come back except for holidays. So the family and the parents and the kids split up at a very early age. And then you have your grandparents who live alone. They don't live with you either. And then once they get to the point where they need some help, they go into assisted living or nursing homes. And so American society encourages, is structured financially and in every other way to have families separate, to segregate more than almost every other society in prior history. And so Thanksgiving is the time of the year where you're supposed to connect to your family. You're supposed to find that special bond that you could only have with your family. And you have this political media, not just observing, but encouraging people to corrupt it, to contaminate it by seeking out, not just disagreement and good faith, but lingering conflict that can fracture families where you purposely raise the kinds of political disputes that you know are likely to produce the greatest source of anger. Why? Think about how politics, the role politics is playing in our society if that's what is supposed to shape and determine whether you even maintain relationships with your lifelong friends and your family. Here at Salon.com, a place that I used to work a long, long time ago, when it was something not great, but much different than it is now, the headline was, Democracy's Last Thanksgiving. Experts imagine America in a year if Trump wins the 2024 election. Quote, if Trump wins in 2024, it will be a dark Thanksgiving indeed, read the headline. So we're almost supposed to assume that if Trump wins... American families can no longer gather in the way they have for centuries in this country on Thanksgiving because once Trump wins, if he does, it means that in 2024, it, once Trump wins, this was written in 2023, family members who have different political views than you, the gap will be so great. The feelings will be so intensely contemptuous that it'll probably just ruin Thanksgiving forever. This was said in part in prediction and in part in great hope that people will no longer be able to maintain positive relations with their family members if they have any of them who voted for Donald Trump. I'm showing you these just to show you that what Joy Reid said, though particularly alienating and a little bit repulsive because of how close she was to the camera, because she's a particularly hateful person, because the way she expressed it was just so creepy, and taking pride in this, this didn't come out of thin air. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.